Hello there and welcome to another Unity tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to continue making the Floor is Lava game that I started in the previous video. We'll start implementing the user interface by creating a heads up display. The heads up display will tell the player how many lives they have left, what their current score is and how much time they have left to complete the level. If you'd like to see a preview of what we're going to create in this tutorial, just skip to the last few minutes of the video. So to begin implementing our UI, we need to create a canvas in our scene. A canvas represents a space where UI elements can be placed and can be projected over the entire screen directly to particular cameras or placed within the world space of the scene itself. To create a canvas, we'll go to the hierarchy window, right click, Go to UI and select Canvas and we'll give this canvas the name Canvas underscore HUD. When you create a canvas in your scene, an event system object will also be created if it doesn't already exist in the scene. And the event system object is responsible for managing the player inputs and translating them into user interface actions. So on the Canvas object, we have four components. There's a Rect Transform which is basically the UI version of a transform component, and it has a couple of extra properties. Then there's the canvas component, which is responsible for actually rendering the canvas and determining where it's projected. Then there's the canvas scaler, which determines how the canvas scales with varying screen sizes. Then there's the graphic ray caster, which is responsible for ray casting against UI game objects. All we need to do is go to the UI scale mode for the canvas scaler and change it to scale with screen size. So this is going to force our canvas to scale with various screen sizes. Now we need to give it a reference resolution to start here with before we begin implementing any user interface elements. Otherwise we'll need to reposition them. Uh, and for this we'll give it a full HD resolution. So we'll say 1920 is going to be our screen width and 1080 pixels is going to be our screen height. Next we need to change our match value. So a value of zero means that the canvas will only scale with varying screen widths and a value of one means the canvas will only scale with varying screen heights. So for this one we're going to set it to 0.5 right in the middle meaning it's going to scale with both screen widths and heights. Okay, so the next thing we'll do is create a very simple crosshair image just to help direct and orient the player. So we're going to right click on the canvas and go to, down to UI and select image. Um, and we'll call this image underscore crosshair. Now, uh, before we start uh, changing any of the properties for this image, let's just change the scene view here to 2D mode. So I'm going to click on the 2D icon in the scene menu here. And I'm just gonna double click on the canvas in the hierarchy to make sure that it's completely visible in the scene window. Then I'll select my crosshair again. Now here, we're gonna just set the size of this uh, image here, just a little bit smaller. So we're gonna set it to a value of 15 pixels wide and fix it 15 pixels high. Uh, and then I'm also gonna give it a sprite in its image component. So I'm gonna give it one of the default sprites um, and I'm gonna give it the knob sprite here. And we can see there's a little knob visible in the game window there. Uh, and let's just change the color here. Maybe I'll change it to orange, yellow. It's a little bit more visible there. It'll be more visible when the uh, game is playing and maximized to the screen size too. Okay, so next we'll create some text to display our score. So again, I'm gonna right click on my canvas in the hierarchy go to UI and I'm going to go down to legacy and select text. Use the legacy text for this and we'll rename this as score display. Okay so right now if I select my canvas we can see that our text is right in the middle of the canvas and I want it to be right up the top. Yeah so basically to sit up the top so um, if we look in the game window we can see the text there as well. Like, yeah I want it to sit right at the top. So what we need to do is we need to anchor our text right at the top of the canvas so that it uses this position up here as its origin point. So I'm gonna click on my score display text and in the rect transform, in, there's this square which kind of looks like a target. There's another square inside it and some and a cross with a yellow dot in the middle. I'm gonna left click on that 
And this is how we change our anchor point, which is the origin point basically for uh, this text, this, this UI object. And we've got a bunch of options here. Note, we also want to hold shift um, and to instantly snap the position, we can hold alt as well, right? Um, we hold shift for the pivot point, which is the point that the object rotates around. So I'm going to select this top center option here, which will move the text to the top of our canvas. And uh, now we can make the actual text a little bit bigger. So I'm going to make it 320 pixels wide by 60 pixels high. And now we can come down to our text component and tweak the options. So first we need to scroll right down and I always do this first. I'm going to select the best fit option. Um, and I'll also center align both horizontally and vertically my text. Uh, for now, we'll replace it where it says new text, we'll just say score display. And now let's change the minimum size for our best fit options. So we'll say 14 pixels uh, is the smallest that our text can be. Now my game window is a little bit scaled up, so I'm gonna scale it down as much as possible. So we can see that it our text here is hugging the top of the screen. I want it to be slightly down, so I have a bit of a, a height buffer there. So scrolling back up to the transform for the text, I'm gonna select the pos Y and put in a value of minus 50, which will keep it 50 pixels from the top of the canvas. Now this text might be a little bit hard to read for the player in at times. So what I like to do with my text is, well, for this particular instance, we're gonna make the text white. So I'm gonna change the color on the text component here and just select white. And now to make sure that this UI element is separated from anything that's going on behind it in the game, I'm gonna add a new component to this text and the component we're gonna add is an outline. So if I zoom in, we can see that our text now has an outline around it. Um, and if we wanna change the distance, we just change these values here and we can make it thicker. Okay, so that's our score display done. Now let's do the same thing for our timer. Now for our timer, it's gonna be exactly the same. We're gonna have all the same properties for our text, but I want to just anchor the timer text to the top left hand of the screen. So first I wanna duplicate this text. We can just use this and change the actual text value and the anchor point for it. So in my hierarchy with my text selected, I'm gonna press Control D on the keyboard. Then I'm gonna rename this object to timer display. You can see it's been renamed now. And now we need to change the anchor point. So in the Rect Transform, I'm gonna click on the Anchor Position option, hold Shift and Alt, and then I'm gonna click on the Left Hand Corner option. Okay, so now I want this text to sit at the same level as my score display. So again, on the Y position, we'll give it a value of minus 50 pixels. And I also want it to be pushed in a little bit from the side of the screen. So I'm also gonna give it a value of positive 50 pixels for the X position. Then of course we need to change the text value. So we'll change it to timer display. Okay, so that's our timer text done. Now the next thing I wanna do is create some icons that are gonna represent how many lives the player has left. So I'm going to come over to the canvas in the hierarchy and I'm gonna create an empty first. And we'll rename this as life display. So you can see in the scene window, this is just an empty object. There's nothing associated with this object. And I'm just gonna use this sort of like as a container for all of our life icons. Um, now I want my icons for the player's lives to sit in the top right hand corner. So we'll start by anchoring this there. So the rect transform for this object, I'm gonna click on it, hold shift and alt, and change it to the top right hand corner. Uh, and of course, I want it to match the alignment of our text elements. So I'm gonna give it a Y position value of negative 50. And I want this one to be pushed to the left of the screen a bit more. So it sits away from the right hand side. So I'm gonna give the X value a value of negative 50. Now this square is not gonna be big enough to hold all of our lives. So we need to resize this as well. Um, now I've been changing the value by 
directly typing it in the transform component. But you can also just click and drag and resize it this way too, right? You can hold shift to scale it up and, and have it keep its ratio. Um, and yeah, but I find this a bit more precise. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna change the width to 375 pixels for this empty object. And that's all we need to do for this one. Okay, so now we're ready to create the life icons. So I'm gonna to go to my hierarchy window, right click on the live display object, go to UI and select image. And we'll rename this image as life icon. Now we'll leave the width and height for this object as 100 and 100. We'll keep it nice and square. All I'm gonna do is go to the source image and I'm just gonna select this background rounded rectangle. Um, and we'll change the color too. We'll change it to like a sort of pinkish red kind of color. Now, if we just select the game manager and just check how many lives we have, we can see that there are three total lives, which means there needs to be three icons. So I'm gonna click on my life icon in the hierarchy window, and I'm gonna press Control D twice which will duplicate the object twice. So we now have three life icons. So I'm gonna click on my first one and I want this one to be anchored to the left-hand side of our life display object. So with that first icon selected, I'm gonna click on the anchor image, hold Shift and Alt, and I'm just gonna click on this left-hand side anchor. Then I'm gonna select the last life icon click on the anchor point, and I'm gonna anchor this one to the right-hand side. So I'm gonna hold Shift and Alt, and click on the right-hand side anchor point. Might just quickly zero off the X position there. So now we actually have our user interface set up. We're ready to actually start coding the HUD script. So I'm going to select my canvas in the hierarchy. I'm gonna to go to the Add Component menu in the inspector. And I'm gonna type the name of the script I wanna create, which we'll call uh, Game HUD, with HUD in all caps. Then I'm gonna select New Script, double check the name, Game HUD, excellent. And then just press Enter, which will create the new script and add it to our object. Then we'll open it from the project window in Visual Studio. So here's the Game HUD script in Visual Studio. We'll start, as usual, by defining the variables we need. So the first variable we will need is going to be a serialized private game object. Uh, but this variable isn't just going to hold one game object, it's gonna hold a reference to several. So we need to turn it into an array. So we do that by following the data type with a set of these square brackets, and then we give it a name. So we're gonna call this life icons. Um, we'll give this a tooltip attribute and the tooltip we'll say is, we'll say a reference to the life icon images in the UI for the scene. So this array here is going to hold a reference to, yeah, all of the life icons. Underneath that variable, we'll have another serialized private variable. Um, now this one is going to be of a user interface type. We wanna hold a reference to the score text. Now, if we try to declare a data type of text, there's a few that seem like it might you know, be similar, but none of these are the data type we need. So in order to make this valid and recognized, we need to inherit another namespace. So at the top of the script, where we have using Unity Engine on the line underneath that, we'll say using Unity Engine, and then we're gonna say dot UI, and then end the line with a semicolon. And now you can see that the text data type is recognized because it's changed color. So we need to give this variable a name now. So we'll say score text. And we'll give this a tooltip as well. So the tooltip for this one will be a reference to the score text in the UI for the scene. Um, now, we're gonna declare one more variable of the same type, and it's gonna have a very similar tooltip. Um, and rather than write it all out again, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna highlight all of this, right? Um, including this space at the end of the line above the stuff I wanna copy. 
Then I'm going to hit Control D on the keyboard, and you'll see that that just creates a duplicate of the text that I'd selected. So now I can just come in here and change the name of this variable, and this one is going to store a reference to our time text. So we'll say time text for the name, and we'll change the tooltip to say a reference to the timer text in the UI for the scene. So they are all the serialized variables that we're going to need to define. But we will define one more um, property here. This is going to be an auto property. Um, and we'll start it by making it public. And it's going to hold a Boolean. And we'll call it cursor enabled. Now, this particular uh, auto property, we only want to be able to use it to set a value. And we're going to set this property up so that when its value is changed, it executes some functionality. So we'll open a set of coding brackets after this and I'm gonna press enter. Next, we just wanna define the keyword set. Then within the coding brackets for our setter, first we're gonna say cursor.visible. And what this will do is it toggles whether or not our uh, cursor is actually visible in the game. And in a first person game, when you're actually playing the game, uh, the cursor isn't usually visible. Now we want to set this to the value that is being sent to our auto property. Um, and Visual Studios is already suggesting what we need to put for that. So we're going to say cursor.visible is equal to, and then the value keyword, and then end the line. So this keyword represents the value being sent to this property. Then under that, we're going to open an if statement. And here we're going to check the, the value of the value being sent to the property. So we want to check if value is equal to true. And if value is equal to true, we're going to say cursor.lock state is equal to cursor lock mode dot confined. So if cursor enabled is being set to true, we're going to set the lock state of the cursor to confined, which means it can be moved around within the active window, which will be the game. We'll add an else statement to counter that if statement. So if value is equal to false, then we're going to say cursor.lock state is equal to cursor lock mode dot locked. And what that will do is it will lock the cursor to the exact center of the screen. So essentially what we're doing here is we're defining whether or not we can see the cursor and whether our cursor is locked to the center of the screen or can move around within the active window. So we'll add a summary that just tells us that for this property. We'll say toggles the visibility uh, and lock state of the mouse cursor. Just like that. And then I'll minimize the property there. So what we're mostly going to do in this script is define a bunch of methods that then get called elsewhere in the game, um, particularly in this case by the game manager. So we aren't actually going to need the update method for this script. We will use the start method though. Um, for now, actually I'll just change that to a summary as usual. Um, Okay, so what we want to do in the start function is we want our score text, we want to update what the text actually says to say we have a current score of zero. Now we'll create a public method for this functionality because we also want to use this functionality when the game manager is used to modify our score. So underneath our start function, I'm going to start by creating a public method with a void return type and we'll call it update score display. Now in the parentheses for this method, we are going to take one parameter. It'll be of the type integer and we'll call it score. Now this method is going to be a very simple one. We're just going to say score text. Then we want to access the text variable within that. And we want to set it equal to, we'll open a string and we'll say score with a semicolon and then a space because we want the value that we're going to print after that to be separated from this text. Then after the string, we'll have a plus sign to concatenate our score onto the end, just like that. 
Now we can write a method summary for this method and we can just say updates the score text to display the past score. Cool. So now in the start method, what we're going to do is we're going to call update score display and pass it a value of zero. So our score display at the beginning of the game will say score followed by a value of zero. Okay, so now we need to define two more methods. So the next method that we define will be a public void as well. And we'll call this update lives. Um, it'll take one parameter of type integer and we'll call it lives. Okay, so what this method will do is it's gonna loop through all of our life icons and depending on the amount of lives that are passed to the function, it's gonna turn those icons on or off so that the uh, HUD displays the right amount of lives. So to loop through all of our life icons, we'll use a for loop, so we say for, then follow that with a set of parentheses. Next, we need to define an iterating variable, a local variable, so that's gonna be of the type int and we'll give it the name i and give it a default value of zero and then follow that with a semicolon. So next we need to define the condition that guides how our for loop iterates. So in this case, we want our for loop to keep counting until the iterator is greater than the amount of life icons that there is. So here we're gonna say while our i variable is less than the value of life icons which is our array and to get the length of that array we follow that with dot length and then we follow that condition with a semicolon and next we need to define how our iterator changes at the end of each iteration so here we want to increase the value of our iterator variable i by one which we can do by saying plus plus so that's our for loop defined we follow that with a set of coding brackets and in the coding brackets defines what happens every iteration. So here is where we define whether the icon that's currently being iterated through is turned on or off. So we'll open an if statement and we'll check if our iterator i is less than the value of the lives being passed to the method. So if our iterator i is equal to zero and the amount of lives passed to the method is three, then we want to turn the icon that's currently being iterated through on because the iterator is within the amount of lives that we have. So to access that icon within our life icons array, we first access the array, life icons, and follow that with a set of square brackets. And here we pass the iterator variable i. Then we can access the methods uh, for that object. And here we want to say dot set active, and we'll pass a value of true to make sure that that object is turned on. Now in any other case, we wanna turn the icon being iterated through off. So we'll add an else statement to counter the if statement. And here we'll access our life icons and we'll pass it i as the index and we'll call dot set active, but here we'll pass a value of false, which will turn the object off. Now underneath the for loop, but still within our update lives method, we'll open an if statement and here we'll say if life icons dot length is less than the amount of lives being passed to the method, we're gonna log a warning in Unity's console. So we can do this by saying debug dot log warning and we'll open a string here and we'll say there are less total life icons than lives then we'll close the line. So that will print a message to the Unity console just to alert you as the developer that you need to have more life icons because there aren't enough life icons at the moment to match the amount of lives that the player has. Okay, so we need one more method now after the update lives method. So underneath that, we will create a new method, which will be a public method. It will have a void return type and we'll call this update time. And this is gonna take a parameter of type float, which we'll call time. So what this method will do is it will convert the time that's being passed to the method, which will be in seconds, uh, into a timer format before it displays it 
So to convert the time that's being passed into minutes and seconds, we are going to have a couple of local variables. The first one will be of the type integer and we'll call it minutes. So what we wanna do here is we wanna divide the time being passed to the method, which again will be in seconds. Um, so we'll divide it by 60, which will give us the amount of minutes that there is. But because that division might also return a decimal, we wanna make sure that we're rounding that down to the uh, lowest equal integer. So we can do that by saying minutes is equal to, and we'll say mathf.floor to int. And what this will do is we pass it a float and it returns the largest integer that's smaller than or equal to uh, the float that we passed it. So here we're gonna say time divided by 60 and then close the line. And that variable will now store the amount of minutes that there are remaining. Underneath that, we'll define another local variable, which will be of the time type integer, and we'll call it seconds. And we're gonna do the same thing, but here we're gonna say mathf.seal to int. And here we're gonna say time, and then use the modulo operator, which is like the percentage sign, and then 60. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna pass us the amount of remaining seconds. So time divided by 60 will give us the amount of minutes, but uh, ignore the remaining amount of seconds. But this function here will actually just give us those remaining seconds instead. Now there is an issue with this in that this will cause uh, the timer to actually display 60 seconds rather than jumping from, you know, one full minute to say 59 seconds. So to correct this underneath here, we'll open an if statement. And here we're gonna check if time is greater than zero. Um, and we want to check a second condition here as well. So we're going to use two ampersands, which will make sure that the condition on the left side of the ampersands and the condition on the right side of the ampersands both are equal to true in order for this if statement to execute. And the second condition we're going to check here is that seconds and then modulo 60 is equal to zero, okay? So that's checking if there is time and the amount of seconds can be divided by 60. So if this if statement executes, we'll say seconds is equal to zero and we'll just add one to the amount of minutes. So now that we've got the time in a numerical format, we need to convert that into a way that can be displayed as a string. So underneath this if statement, we'll open a local string variable and we'll call this time string. And we're going to format this using a method called string.format. So a method that's actually within the string data type. And what we do here is we pass it a string in the format that we want, and then we pass it the arguments that it's going to put in to that format. So we'll open a string as our first uh, parameter here, and we'll say time left. And after that, I'm going to uh, put a space and then open a set of coding brackets, then put a colon, then open another set of coding brackets here. And inside the first one, we're gonna say zero, and then a colon, and then two zeros. And then in the second one, we're gonna say one, and then a colon, and then two zeros. After the string, as the second parameter of the method, we're gonna pass minutes variable and then the last parameter will be the seconds variable so what this is doing is this is the string that's actually going to be displayed but it's not going to display this part like this the arguments that we've passed after our string will be moved into these two brackets so the first parameter has an element index of zero because it's the first argument being passed so that's what's going to be displayed here and it's gonna be displayed in a format where it always has two numbers, which is what these two zeros on this side represent. This second set of brackets here will display the parameter with an index of one. So this is the second argument, which has an uh, element index of one. And again, displaying it in a format where it will always have two digits. So now that we have our string appropriately formatted and stored in our time string variable, 
Underneath that, we're going to say time text dot text is equal to time string and then close the line. So with that done, we can actually save the script. Actually, I need to come down and create some method summaries for these methods. So for our update lives method, we'll say update the amount of life icons being displayed based on the past number of lives. And then for our update timer method, update time method, we'll say formats the past time in stopwatch format and updates the timer text. Excellent. So now we'll save the script with control S and I want to open my game manager script. So I'll come over to my solution explorer over here and double click on game manager. Alternatively, you could open it from within the unity project window. Okay. So when our game manager, what I'm going to do is first, we're going to create a private variable. And this variable is going to be of the type game HUD and we'll just call it HUD. Then we'll come down to the awake function and we'll say HUD is equal to find object of type. Then open a set of chevron brackets and we'll pass game HUD as the type within that. Then an empty set of parentheses and a semicolon. So that will find and locate and store a reference to our game HUD object at the beginning of the game. Next, we'll come down to the start method. And in the start method, we want to update our lives. So we'll say HUD.UpdateLives. And we'll pass our lives variable as the parameter for that. Next, we'll come down to the update method. And underneath the if statement, that's checking if the level timer is less than or equal to zero. That then calls the game over method. Uh, underneath that if statement, we're going to reference our HUD and call the update time method. And here we're going to pass level timer and then close the line. So now we need to scroll down to our modify score method. And whenever we modify the score, we also need to update the HUD. So we'll say HUD.update score display and pass it our current score after we've already modified the value of the current score. Lastly, we'll come down to our subtract life method. And when we subtract a life from our lives, we also need to update our HUD. So we'll say HUD.update lives and then pass it the lives variable. So with all of that done, all we need to do now is make sure our scripts are safe. So I'm going to Control S to save this script. Now we can go back into Unity, set up all our references and test out the functionality. Okay, so I'm back in Unity. I'm gonna select my canvas in the hierarchy and we can see the game HUD script attached to it. Um, we'll expand the canvas in the hierarchy actually. So we'll set our text references first. So I'm gonna drag the score display game object to the score text variable in the game HUD script then the timer display text into the time text variable in the game HUD script. Then in the game HUD script, I'm going to expand our life icons uh, variable here. And I could just type the size directly in here, but uh, I'm going to hit the plus sign here three times. And now I can expand my life display uh, game object in the hierarchy and drag my life icons in the same order into my array. So with those variables set, all I have to do now is hit play and test everything out. Okay, so the game is running. We can see that uh, my timer is updating and displaying the current amount of time that's, that's left. Our score text has updated to zero and our life icons, or well, they haven't done anything because we haven't lost a life. So let's go and lose a life. We lose a life and we can see a life icon disappears. Let's just lose the rest of our lives. There goes another one. 
There goes the last one. Good. Um, let's try this score item. So we'll go this middle one first. Okay, I've got 15. Good. That one then was minus 10, which took uh, 10 away. That's good. And that one added another 5. Um, and you can see, yeah, the timer has maintained the correct time all the way through. If we go into the end trigger, the timer stops because uh, the timer in the game manager has actually stopped. So there you have it, a very simple but functional game heads up display. If you enjoyed this tutorial and found it useful, please leave a like. If you'd like to see more game development tutorials like this, consider subscribing. Have a great day and thank you for watching.